Section 36 of The Science History of the Universe, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 1. Edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Astronomy. Chapter 24. Nebulae and Star Clusters. Part 1. Nebulae are masses of diffused shining gas which are scattered through space and which undoubtedly consist of the matter out of which stars have been and are being formed. They differ from star clusters in that the highest powered telescopes yet constructed are unable to resolve them into separate component stars. Yet without doubt star clusters are evolved from nebulae and their connection is most intimate. For the first record of nebula we go back to Huygens. 1629 to 1695, and find in his Systema Saturnium not only a description but a rough drawing. The description is of the nebula Orion and is as follows. There is one phenomenon among the fixed stars worthy of mention which, so far as I know, has hitherto been noticed by no one, and indeed cannot be well observed except with large telescopes. In the sort of Orion are three stars quite close together. In 1656, as I chanced to be viewing the middle one of these with a telescope, instead of a single star twelve showed themselves, a not uncommon circumstance. Three of them almost touched one another, and, with four others, shone through a nebula, so that the space around them seemed far brighter than the rest of the heavens, which was entirely clear, and appeared quite black, the effect being that of an opening in the sky, through which a brighter region was visible. The work thus inaugurated by Huygens, for some reason or other, did not seem to attract the attention of astronomers for many years, although Lacaille, while at the Cape of Good Hope, 1750 to 1754, observed and described 42 nebulae, nebular stars, and star clusters, and although Charles Miser, 1730 to 1817, who devoted himself to the detection of comets, found he was liable to mistake nebulae for comets, and recorded in 1781 the positions of 103 of the former. In the meantime, in 1755, Immanuel Kant, the famous philosopher, advanced the theory on purely theoretical and speculative grounds that a single nebula or star cluster was an assemblage of stars comparable in magnitude and structure with the aggregation which we now term the Milky Way and with other separate stars which could be seen. According to this theory, the sun would be but one star of a cluster, and every nebula a system of the same order. This was known as the island universe theory, and was first accepted by Sir William Herschel. In the course of his indefatigable investigations of the stars, with his large telescopes, Herschel inaugurated a systematic study of the nebulae and star clusters. Although he found it difficult to draw a line between nebulae and star clusters, yet he was able to state positively and correctly that they were not identical. Herschel noted the position of each nebula and its general appearance and marked the positions on a star map. He published catalogues, the first of which, prepared in 1786, contained 1,000 nebulae and clusters, the second, in 1789, of about the same extent, and a third, in 1802, comprising 500. Herschel's observations of nebulae enabled him to note their differences in brightness and apparent structure so that he could divide them into eight classes. In 1786 he published the following interesting account of the varieties in form which he had observed. I have seen double and treble nebulae, variously arranged, large ones with small, seeming attendants, narrow but much extended, lucid nebulae or bright dashes, some of the shape of a fan resembling an electric brush, issuing from a lucid point, others of the cometic shape, with a seeming nucleus in the center, or like cloudy stars surrounded with nebulous atmosphere, a different sort again contain a nebulosity of the milky kind, like that wonderful inexplicable phenomenon about Orionis, while others shine with a fainter model kind of light, which denotes their being resolvable into stars. Herschel's great problem was to determine the relation between nebulae and star clusters. Often the difference between the two was made apparent only by the use of a telescope of sufficient power to resolve a bright glow in the heavens into clusters of stars, but at the same time there were bright places that still remained nebulous. Hence Herschel wrote, 
nebulae can be selected so that an insensible gradation shall take place from a coarse cluster like the Pleiades down to a milky nebulosity like that in Orion, every intermediate step being represented. To Herschel it seemed that the power of the telescope was the important consideration, and the gradation mentioned, he writes, tends to confirm the hypothesis that all are composed of stars more or less remote. As Herschel progressed with his investigations, the views of other astronomers, as well as those first entertained by him, did not seem tenable. By 1791 he reached the point of view that in certain cases at least the nebulae were essentially different from star clusters. Referring to a certain nebulous star, he wrote, Cast your eye on this cloudy star, and the result will be no less decisive. Your judgment, I may venture to say, will be that the nebulosity about the star is not of a starry nature. Herschel reasoned that if the phenomenon were due to an aggregation of far distant stars, that there must be one central star of extraordinary dimensions, or that something radically different, such as a shining fluid of a nature totally unknown to us, must be called upon to explain the appearance. His observations proved that an individual nebula was usually surrounded by a region of the sky comparatively free from stars, and that where clusters were common near the Milky Way, nebulae incapable of resolution were scarce, but were crowded together in parts of the sky most remote from this region. In short, Herschel believed that the nebulae and clusters were external universes, and he early believed that both were objects of the same kind at different stages of development, the result of a clustering power working to convert a diffused nebula into a brighter and more condensed body thus indicating the process of evolution or age. Barry, in his Short History of Astronomy, to which we are largely indebted for this record of Herschel's work in the nebulae, thus summarizes Herschel's last views of this important phenomenon. His change of opinion in 1791 as to the nature of nebulae led to a corresponding modification of his views of this process of condensation. Of the star already referred to, he remarked that its nebulous envelope was more fit to produce a star by its condensation than to depend upon the star for its existence. In 1811 and 1814, he published a complete theory of a possible process whereby the shining fluid, constituting a diffused nebula, might gradually condense, the denser portions of it being centers of attraction, first into a denser nebula or compressed star cluster, then into one or more nebulous stars, lastly into a single star or group of stars. Every supposed stage in this process was abundantly illustrated from the records of actual nebulae and clusters which he had observed. In the latter paper, he also for the first time recognized that the clusters in and near the Milky Way really belonged to it and were not independent systems that happened to lie in the same direction as seen by us. Herschel's observations were utilized by Laplace, who was engaged in involving a theory to explain the evolution of the universe. While his nebular hypothesis, in its relation to other theories and systems, will be discussed more fully in the following chapter, yet in this connection it is desirable to explain how Laplace was able to fit the results of Herschel's observations to his theory. Laplace had inferred that the planets and their satellites must have been derived from some common source, and he suggested that either they might have been condensed from a body and be regarded as a sun with a vast atmosphere filling the space now occupied by the solar system, or that they represented the results of condensation of a fluid mass which now possessed a more or less condensed central nucleus, which at one time was not in existence. The nebulae of Herschel accordingly suggested to Laplace a suitable fluid mass from which a solar system could have been condensed, and, furthermore, the evolution of the fixed stars could be explained on a similar basis. This ingenious theory of Laplace's was rather a scientific speculation than an accurate conclusion founded on the data he had himself observed. As a theory, whether accepted or not, it has proved of the most vital importance to science. John Frederick William Herschel, 1792 to 1871, published a catalog, 1833, of about 2,500 nebulae, of which some 500 were new and 2,000 were his father's, a few being due to other observers, and later re-observed about 500 known nebulae while at the Cape of Good Hope, 1833 to 1838, including the nebulae surrounding the variable star Eta Argus, 
and the wonderful collection of nebulae, clusters, and stars known as the nebuculae, or Magellanic Clouds. In 1864, Herschel was able to present to the Royal Society a valuable catalogue of all known nebulae and clusters, amounting to 5,079. Later, this great catalogue, which contained a condensed description of each body, was superseded by Dr. Dreyer's general catalogue, which was based upon it, and contained 7,840 nebulae and clusters, known up to the end of 1887. A supplementary list, subsequently published by the same authority, contained 1,529 entries of discoveries made between 1888 and 1894. Hence, the two Herschels are responsible for more than half of the total number of nebulae and star clusters now known to astronomers. Sir John Herschel was of the opinion that no nebula existed that could not be resolved into a group of stars if a sufficiently powerful telescope were employed. With the various large reflectors in use during the first half of the 19th century, gradually a limit was reached. Some nebulae remained unresolved, which led to the conclusion either that still more powerful instruments were required, or that they were in their nature unresolvable. Herbert Spencer, believing that the principle of evolution must operate universally, and that the stars must be formed from nebulae, ventured to oppose the astronomers in their belief that only telescopic power was needed to resolve nebulae into groups of stars. In fact, from the point of view of the astronomer, the study of nebulae had almost ceased when a new method was introduced, which served not only to throw a vast amount of light on the question, but practically to turn astronomical research into new channels. In 1864, the first positive clue to the nature of nebulae was gained by Sir William Huggins when he was able to obtain, with the spectroscope, a characteristic spectrum of the planetary nebula in Draco. This discovery was interestingly described by Sir William in the following account, recorded in the Publications of the Tools Hill Observatory, Volume 1. On the evening of August 29, 1864, I directed the spectroscope for the first time to a planetary nebula in Draco. I looked into the spectroscope. No spectrum such as I had expected, a single bright line only. At first I suspected some displacement of the prism, and that I was looking at a reflection of the illuminated slit from one of its faces. This thought was scarcely more than momentary. Then the true interpretation flashed upon me. The light of the nebulae was monochromatic, and so, unlike any other light I had as yet subjected to prismatic examination, could not be extended out to form a complete spectrum. After passing through the two prisms, it remained concentrated into a single bright line having a width corresponding to the width of the slit and occupying in the instrument a position at that part of the spectrum to which its light belongs in refrangibility. A little closer look showed two other bright lines on the side toward the blue, all three lines being separated by intervals relatively dark. The riddle of the nebulae was solved. The answer which had come to us in the light itself read, not an aggregation of stars, but a luminous gas. This discovery marked a new era in astronomical progress. Its importance was at once appreciated, and the ability of the spectroscope to distinguish between a glowing gas and a star-like mass of partially condensed vapors solved the problem that had so seriously concerned the elder Herschel, and immediately brought the spectroscope forward as the chief instrument that must be employed in the larger problem of the evolution of the stars in the universe. It was at once apparent that these amorphous nebulae might supply the material from which the stars were formed, and that the process was one of evolution and possibly mere condensation. What the spectroscope actually has accomplished for research on the nature of the nebulae was excellently summed up by Sir David Gill in his presidential address before the British Association for the Advancement of Science at Leicester, 1907. Huggins's spectroscope, he said, has shown that many nebulae are not stars at all that many well-condensed nebulae, as well as vast patches of nebulous light in the sky, are but inchoate masses of luminous gas. Evidence upon evidence has accumulated to show that such nebulae consist of the matter out of which stars, i.e. suns, have been and are being evolved. The different types of star spectra form such a complete and gradual sequence, from simple spectra resembling those of nebulae outward through types of gradually increasing complexity, as to suggest that we have before us, written in the cryptograms of these spectra, the complete story of the evolution of suns, 
from the inchoate nebula outward to the most active sun like our own and then downward to the almost heatless and invisible ball the period during which human life has existed upon our globe is probably too short even if our first parents had begun the work to afford observational proof of such a cycle of change in any particular star but the fact of such evolution with the evidence before us can hardly be doubted end of section thirty six